So we're ready to get started. David is the lead engineer for this project with the core of, Corps of Engineers out in Sacramento. So he's been involved with the project for many years, design, and now nearing the end of construction. Um, so he has a lot to talk about, so I'm going to hand it over to him. All right, Greg, I appreciate that. Yeah, so bear with me. I know it's the end of your day there on the East Coast, um, but I'm hoping this will keep you guys moving. It's a fascinating project. Um, I'm going to cover it from sort of cradle to grave um, from study all the way through construction. Um, we probably will also have um, Henry Mulder, um, the embankment engineer, joining in to listen in. And then he'll be off, hopefully, uh, he's on actually, I see him there. He'll be on also for Q&A. Um, I think it'd be good for you guys to have some firsthand experience in talking to an embankment engineer. Um, so this project, um, Isabella Dam, is one of the Corps' largest dam safety modification projects underway, and it's been in, you know, in the works for quite some time. Um, with this case history, I'm gonna identify the major risk driving failure modes, the potential failure modes on this project, discuss the design and construction considerations that happen during the design phase, talk about sourcing, handling, and sequencing of materials to build the project, and then observations and lessons learned during construction. Those are the key um, learning objectives. So really, I mean, you're gonna see a brief overview of the project here upcoming, and I'm, I'm gonna focus in on really getting, giving you an understanding on, on why we have a project, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the latter part of the presentation will be focused much more on embankment construction, design and construction, and in particular, the um, design and construction of the auxiliary dam. Um, project overview. So Isabella Dam is, is located in California. It's uh, Kern County, California, so just north of Los Angeles. And it's in the Kern River watershed. Um, it's about 110 miles north of LA for just for orientation. It's a pretty large drainage basin and a complicated one for us to understand hyd hydraulically, or I should say hydrologically and hydraulically and for that matter. Um, it has a very large rain and snow um, influence um, since it does encompass Mount Whitney at 14,500 feet and below down to 2,500 feet for the lake elevation. It's um, rated a DSAC-1. That's our dam safety action classification for the Corps. So that's our highest level um, class risk dam, primarily on the consequences because it does protect the city of Bakersfield, which is about 350,000 people downstream as well as the town of Lake Isabella immediately downstream. So the consequences really drive a DSAC-1, but so do the number of deficiencies we're gonna talk about. Um, current status, um, we're in construction, we're wrapping up construction. We had a notice to proceed in January of 18. Contractor is a uh, joint venture between Flatiron, Dragados, and Sukit. And we're anticipating completion of this project in early 23. We'll talk through that in this presentation a little bit. So primary project features. Um, so this the facility itself was constructed between 48 and 53. Um, there are various phases of construction between the main dam and the auxiliary dam um, and Borel. And we'll talk a little bit about that, the outlet works that runs to the auxiliary dam. Um, its primary purposes are flood risk management. It's, it's the dominant um, purpose of the project. There is a cost shared irrigation component and there's a non federal hydropower component. It's about 568,000 acre feet when full, um, but we're currently restricted by 20 feet for a reservoir restriction for safety concerns, which um, lowers us to about 360,000 acre feet. There's two dams. So there's a main dam. That original height is about 185 feet tall. It's a zoned earth fill but essentially nearly homogenous. Um, it does have a blanket drain. There's no chimney drains. And the foundation itself is on really solid granitic rock. I mean, it's, it's a, a great foundation um, for a dam. The auxiliary dams, the other feature, the embankment feature, um, it's not as tall, it's 100 feet tall. It's a homogenous silty sand embankment. There is a blanket drain, but there's no chimney drains in it. Um, and the foundation here is completely in contrast to the main dam. It's on a very thick alluvial um, foundation from an alluvial fan deposit, um, which I'll show on the next slide, which really is the genesis for a lot of the seismic concerns and um, seepage and internal erosion concerns at the project. 
Um, between both dams, there's an ungated spillway, um, an OG structure that um, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about this project. The modifications include construction of a brand new emergency spillway and some modifications to this existing spillway, which is now a service spillway. So um, Auxiliary Dam Foundation, I kind of touched on this. So original design for this project, essentially for site selection, they, they located the dam on the apex of this F1 fan deposit which um, was chosen because they were able to build the, the shortest dam um, on this project, you know, over for the auxiliary dam site. And with that, they built in a lot of problems in the foundation that, you know, I don't think we fully embraced or understood at the time um, from internal erosion standpoint and from a liquefiability standpoint. You'll also see this bright red line across. There's a Kern Canyon fault. Um, inscarpment that runs right through the right abutment of the auxiliary dam. I'm going to talk quite a bit about that and how we've modified that here in this presentation as well. So just on the loading, just to give you a sense of the loading potential. So for hydrologic, um, we under existing conditions and under the PMF the way we know it, and it's been revised for this project, we would overtop both of these embankments by nine feet under a PMF load with an overtopping frequency of about 28, one in 2,800 year. So it's a pretty significant miss on the hydrology here um, in terms of reservoir capacity and also spillway capacity to pass that event. Um, seismically, we also have some pretty large events here, especially with the Kern Canyon Fault being an active source. Um, the project was not designed as that being an active source. So that adds a much higher level of ground accelerations, but in particularly more concerning the potential for active fault rupture through the right abutment. Um, our OBE level earthquake, which is driven for this project primarily by San Andreas and a few of those more distant events that are 200 kilometers and longer durations is about 0 0.087, or I guess 0.09 G. Um, and our MCE is roughly three quarters of a G. So on the hazard curves themselves, this is just the general hazard curve we used for both risk evaluation and design. Um, you'll see the hazard curve for really for PGAs greater than about 0.4 is really driven by this Kern Canyon fault, which is this green line. Um, Accelerations lower than that, the more frequent earthquakes are from background seismicity and and other um, faults nearby. This gives you a range of the amount of loading at this project. And of course, sitting in California, it it has a higher potential or higher likelihood of of greater accelerations. I'm um, also note here this did use utilize all the next generation attenuation relationships. Um, during the study and, and design phase, which actually brought the ground motion. So those are the loads and with those loads, unfortunately we have um, a number of issues at this project. So we, we deem those as potential failure modes um, that are under dam safety modification currently. So we did two different PFMAs along the way on this project and identified a significant number, I mean, it's over 63 or 63 failure modes that were identified, but probably the, the greater number there is the, the 21 risk driving failure modes after evaluation. Those are failure modes that we've carried forward that we think are above the tolerable risk guidelines and that need action. Um, and they're in the three areas of deficiency, again, of the hydrologic overtopping, seepage and internal erosion, and seismic fault rupture. So it's illustrated on this graphic here on the screen, but um, you know, as I mentioned, we can overtop both dams. So both dams have a hydrologic overtopping failure mode we're addressing um, in combination with the spillway, which I'll talk about a little bit because it becomes a core resource for us in this project or has been. Um, we also have the potential based on geometries in the bedrock and potential for transverse cracks, both statically and seismically at both dams. Um, a transverse crack could manifest, and like I mentioned, without the um, incline drain or a, an incline drain in these dams, um, 
were deficient there in, in preventing or you know minimizing the risk associated with internal erosion at that point, or concentrated leak erosion probably is the, the better way to say that. Um, and then at the auxiliary dam, which I'll talk a bit more about, uh, obviously here in this presentation, um, we're addressing active fault rupture. Like I mentioned, that was previously thought to be inactive. We're also addressing uh, several failure modes associated with an embedded conduit and tower that are seismically deficient and also don't have the right provisions for internal erosion and addressing the liquefiability and, and internal erosion potential of the foundation of the auxiliary dam. So um, modifications, so that last slide were the issues. These are the modifications, um, just all on one slide here. So essentially we are, um, I apologize looking here, it looks like some of my graphics may have shifted a little bit the color, but uh, the both dams are essentially being raised 16 feet to address the hydrologic overtopping deficiency in combination with an emergency spillway, which is, been constructed between both dams and to the left as you look downstream from the service spillway. Um, for the auxiliary dam, we have constructed a full height buttress that included removal and replacement of liquefiable materials and then essentially a full height filter and drain um, section with a filter drain transition and rock fill zone, which I'll, I'll describe in a, just a slide or two. Again, the focus is gonna be on the auxiliary dam. For Borel, um, we've been able to fill and abandon most of Borel in place using lightweight cellular concrete. We did remove three sections of the conduit, which I'll show here in a little bit on the downstream end. Um, I'll, I'll touch on this. Um, coming out of what we call our dam safety modification study, we did have approval to build a new tunnel and replace the facility for Borel, but during design, we actually were able to realize a a refinement there to acquire the easement and basically um, not have to provide a conveyance of water downstream for the utility um, so Southern California Edison. So it was a significant, I, I think, simplification of the work for us, not having to build a tunnel. Um, two other items, I'm gonna to touch on these as I talk about design refinements, but the main dam includes two concrete abutments that were constructed, essentially one along Highway 155 and one along the service spillway in order to accommodate the, the 16 foot raise. And then the auxiliary dam has a, a new section of dam, which we call the dog leg, which avoided a highway relocation where it ties into to higher ground. So we're gonna cover that too as a design refinement later. Um, just to give you a context of the spillway modifications here, I don't I only have a few slides on this, but this does be, again become the core resource for the project, as you'll see through design and, and then in, constru in construction. Um, the emergency spillway was uh, basically planned and designed and implemented with the do no harm principle. Um, we knew we had an active failure mode of overtopping of both embankments at a, you know, at a given frequency. Um, and the Labyrinth Weir and its construction, or design and construction, essentially mimics the frequency of the overtopping over the weir. Um, so with that said, I'll try to illustrate it a little bit because I think it's important for understanding how we've addressed and built the crest raises here. The top of this Labyrinth Weir that's being constructed is the same height of the original dam. Um, and it's a 28 foot tall labyrinth. So the bottom of the labyrinth is actually the top of the OG and the service spillway. So if you're following me, the, the OG and service spillway operations start 28 feet below the, um, as, as original you know, design and, and how it's performed to date, um, below the top of the emergency spillway. And the emergency spillway only kicks in really to prevent overtopping of both embankments in conjunction with the raise and the embankments. Uh, so that's sort of the operation of the spillway. The, the one takeaway here on the spillway is it did provide us with about three million yards of rock, um, bank cubic yards of rock that we were able to utilize for, for various products, which I'll talk about. So just another graphic of the emergency spillway. It's a 12 cycle arc labyrinth weir. It's like I mentioned, it's 28 feet tall, excavated into granitic rock. Um, the depth of this excavation ranged anywhere from a, 
about 80 to 100. Um, maximum depth was 120. We've actually exceeded that in some areas because of a deepening on the downstream end to gain additional borrow material during construction. So it's a, a pretty deep excavation, as you'll see in the photos. So that's the spillway. I'm going to start focusing in here on the embankments. Um, so I don't, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus mostly on the auxiliary dam in this talk, but I'm going to highlight what we did at the main dam because I think it does bring in some construction considerations and and working in very tight areas, um, some discussion on that. So the, the main dam modifications, as I mentioned, include a 16-foot raise. It includes essentially rework of the upper end of the embankment on the upstream end and then a complete overlay on the downstream end. So you'll see that the crest alignment, the center line of the main dam, was essentially unchanged. It's, it's a slight shift downstream, but we had a lot of tight site constraints between the powerhouse at the toe, between where we were gonna hit a center line for the highway and a center line in terms of a high point on the service spillway. So this typical cross section of the main dam, it's got a, a filter, which you can barely see here. It's five feet wide, five foot wide drain, 12 foot wide transition, and then the outer blue is the rock fill layer on the, the embankment itself. Again, as in, I'm going to compare this to the auxiliary dam, very little excavation into the foundation for the buttress. We were really just getting below any overburden or some of the uh, um, left alluvium, which was not very thick down at the toe of the dam um, on top of the granite rock. So we were placing this on rock. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have the crest rays and some rework of the riprap. I touched on this already a little bit, but to accommodate the 16 foot rays at the main dam, we had to build abutments essentially to tie into. So we had a highway 155, which is shown on the left here, um, that we essentially had to reroute during construction and, and essentially build a, a tertiary spillway. I'm not going to get into all the nuances of that in this presentation, but we were building a, essentially a corridor um, that originally had a gate on it, and then we realized that if you couldn't close the gate, the gated structure, this would have to be designed to withstand flows over the roadway, um, which um, that's why I mentioned tertiary spillway. So main thing here is we've built a concrete, um, essentially a concrete gravity wall on the right abutment. And on the left abutment, which you see in the photo here on the right, we raise the existing service spillway wall. Um, there's some sections in here on the more of the downstream end that were completely replaced in some areas that were just essentially with an overlay type raise in order to um, withstand the, the embankment raise and seismic loading really associated with that. There's also a setback wall in the service spillway, which protects the toe and, and groin contact in the main dam. So that's the main dam modifications. Um, as I mentioned for Borel, I've got a few slides here. So for Borel, um, we were able to abandon most of Borel in place. So that included removal of three conduit sections downstream from the toe in. We've got a few aerials of that here soon. And then the rest of the Borel facility was infilled with LCC. So that went in one foot lifts. Um, so there were 10 of them total. There's two barrels. And then there was also contact grouting done within Borel. So that really to seal up any of the annular space, um, we wanted to make sure we didn't leave any voids through the embankment um, on the downstream end or that could get to the downstream end, which is essentially filtered. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that here in a second. Um, one of the other aspects is we didn't want to add weight to the facility. So we obviously didn't want to put normal weight concrete in here and have settlement. This conduit sits on alluvium. We wanted to mimic the original weight. So the, the weight of the, the conduit placement was 62 pounds per cubic foot and the um, tower, which was also infilled, um, actually used a combination of foam and um, geofoam type foam and, and LCC, with, which essentially a, a unit weight of less than 30 pounds per cubic foot on average. 
Um, I'll touch on it here and then we'll show some graphics. So as I mentioned, you know, we've been able to seal up any potential voids or any of the concern of having a through going pathway of seepage through the conduit. And on the downstream of that, downstream end of that, we were able to excavate during construction around the entire annulus of this conduit and seal it off with a fairly large filter section that ties into both the horizontal filter and the incline section of filter. So like the main dam, just another um, conceptual view here of what the modifications to the auxiliary dam look like. Again, from this point on, I'm gonna focus mostly on the auxiliary dam. So the auxiliary dam, unlike the main dam, has a varying thickness of the internal zones through the dam. I'm gonna talk a lot about why that is here um, as we go through the presentation. Essentially the same incline and horizontal filter, same with the drain, a transition, a rock fill layer, which is the blue. Um, and again, this is a much larger um, embankment section that we've constructed, primarily because we're looking for the buttressing effects um, for seismic, to resist seismic deformation. And we'll show you some of the inputs and analyses of that here. So auxiliary dam, so there were a number of refinements, just like any design, there, there's a lot of refinements as you go from 15% to 30% to 60% to 95%. Um, we had a lot of changes, some of those influenced by cost, some of those influenced by just knowing what materials we had on site to utilize and be most efficient on. Like I mentioned, we have a very large um, excavation that we had the benefit of using that went into the emergency spillway um, into hard granitic rock. So I, I kind of touched on this already. We, we incorporated a left abutment modification at Highway 178, which eliminated essentially a very costly relocation of the highway. Um, and that's sort of the dog leg section, which I'll talk about the design of that. Um, we also reduced and adjusted some of the thicknesses of the internal filter and drain features through the design refinements, reduced the overall footprint in total volume. Um, as we did refined analyses, mostly with flak deformation type modeling, we were able to adjust the slope of the downstream um, shell itself, as well as the um, crest width. Uh, this crest width, we actually widened the crest with the modifications um, up to 40 feet. So I'll, I'll discuss that as well. And then we adjusted um, features, you know, between the Kern Canyon fault zone and then outside the Kern Canyon fault zone, knowing that we would get more normal type movement at the Kern Canyon fault zone and a different type of movement likely in the embankment outside of that zone. Just some other graphics so that the previous um, ones were for, um, sorry, one slide ahead here. So the, this, the, these graphics on the screen show where we were at 35% design. You can see we had a four to one slope at 65 that was modified to a three to one and then a lower five to one. However, later that during design, um, as we got to 95%, so on the next slide, we actually went with a three to one slope. And primarily because we saw that we had enough stabilizing effect of the buttress, as well as we were using rock fill materials in the downstream shell. And then, like I mentioned before, um, the left abutment. So the, the new, essentially a new section of dam that was constructed to create the dog leg um, on this left abutment of the auxiliary dam to tie into high ground and again to avoid the Highway 178 relocations. This section of the embankment you'll see um, is a much more traditional section. Um, with the exception maybe the core going as far upstream, but there's you know essentially a centralized core and a filter drain transition and rock fill section. Um, it's all new construction again. All right, so the next section here, I'm gonna talk about the design of the downstream buttress to reduce the seismic deformation potential. So we're gonna start with sort of the characterization of that. I know you've seen that a lot in this course in terms of the importance of characterization. Um, we had the benefit with this project that it was pretty heavily studied during the study phase, um, during the dam safety modification study to understand 
the problems with it, and we were able to benefit early on with some of those results to understand how we might fix it. Um, we did, however, have to add some investigation programs during design really to tighten that up and understand what needed to be designed and what needed to be put out for contract. So for the most part, we had a number of standard penetration tests, data available, cone penetrometer tests, CPTs available, and a lot of shear wave velocity measurements. Um, a few decades ago that we were able to pull from. This is just kind of a summary of the investigations, um, locations of borings, just from, mostly from the study. Some of these went into early design, but this is mostly study phase locations to identify the risk of the project. And then, of course, looking at the data, um, we had a significant amount of data to process on this project. This here is, um, SPT across SPT data, so standard penetration test data across the um, foundation itself based on elevation. And I guess one thing, you know, when you're looking at data, so in this case, you know, there's it looks like a shotgun splatter. But as you see, when we start looking specifically at depth below the foundation or the foundation contact, you'll see we start seeing more prominent layers. Um, we also looked at the um, both the fines content and plasticity index, and if there were any trends in that with layers um, to try to correlate with the SPT values for liquefiability. So that's kind of the data composite. Um, we used um, leapfrog software and a few other techniques to plot that in a 3D sense. So really looking at 3D um, plots as well as fence diagrams of the N160 data. and what really jumped out at us um, during both the study and then even in design is that we really had a bad actor, um, bad actor being, you know, a fairly cleaner, a fairly clean, silty sand, but I say it's fairly clean, um, that was, had a low density in the upper 15 to 20 feet of the foundation. So that you'll see on the next few slides was one of our, our key layers that we knew we had to target. Um, one of the things we did in in PED, uh, we knew that this foundation would be um, one, difficult to characterize given the alluvial fan and what we knew about it ahead and, and that we didn't really wanna be doing a lot of characterization and assessment during construction and holding up a contractor potentially. So we went in with a, essentially a targeted program of CPTs and companion SPTs um, during design to really kind of delineate and predefine the foundation elevation target um, that we needed to take out for the buttress. So you'll see here, this plot is a 3D data plot of the CPTs, um, which um, you can see, um, well, I'm gonna go to the next slide actually for the, the next part of that. So um, as I mentioned, you know, we had companion SPTs with the CPTs, um, during that phase. And really we wanted to make sure we had ground truthing in a lot of ways and samples collected of the CPT data. Um, it's really important, I think, to, to make sure you get a site calibration, especially for soils. Like at this site, we had a lot of issue with, you know, when this soil dries out, it gets very stiff, um, very hard. It's almost, in fact, we've, we've broke um, CPT rods here at this project. Um, so it's good to understand, you know, it's it, yeah, it's good to touch the soil, I guess. That's why we drove a lot of SPTs to get companion holes. And again, this is all with trying to predefine the buttress excavation footprint um, for design. So the other part of that, and I realize this slide may actually be a little out of sequence, but I'll, I'll touch on it here. Um, one of the things we did in design is we knew that we were excavating in the toe of an active project that we had to keep active during construction. And in addition to that, it's a DSAC-1 project, so very high risk um, with many internal erosion failure modes. So there's obvious concern when you do that. Um, so we spent a fairly good level of time and effort during design to come up with a government level um, dewatering design for the required excavation. Um, we came up with a couple different strategies that we thought would be effective, which really helped 
in a lot of ways define the parameters for the contract um, and for the contract or to follow um, once we had an, a feel for the site itself. So this this was a contracted or contract or design um, dewatering system, but with provisions targets essentially that they had to dewater to based on our understanding because um, we did have to keep this project fully functional up to a restricted pool um, during construction. So for station 65, I'm going to now talk about the characterization that we use for flak deformation modeling. Um, you may have heard some of this already. So one thing um, we wanted to do is select a couple um, sections that were really critical for design. So one of those being six, station 65, where we have liquefiable materials near the surface. Um, in this case, we've got a, a blow count that we assessed of about 15 near the surface that we wanted to model um, in this section, as well as a deeper, um, you know, deeper portion of the fan deposit where we also have lower densities. Again, not as low as the 15, but we see blow counts on average about 25.3 at depth. These aren't as a concern for most projects, um, but for this one, given the, the severity of the, the ground accelerations, it, it does become a, a problem you know, or, or a, something that could contribute to deformation. So with, with that section, we did run some flak analyses, um, and I'm just gonna show what we did for MCE level. So the, this is about the 30,000 year event, kind of the worst case loading with a three to one slope for the buttress, a 40 foot wide crest. Um, we assessed and evaluated both horizontal displacement, the vertical displacement, and then the maximum shear strain increment. And you see, even with the buttress um, at these very large, um, you know, and very infrequent, but very large earthquake shakes, we see, you know, deformation still. And it's one of the reasons you'll see in the design why we have some fairly wide filters and drains across the entire crest of the um, auxiliary dam buttress section. And that's important for the horizontal. It's also important for the vertical in terms of having sufficient freeboard on the embankment post seismic event. So we did have the benefit as we addressed the hydrologic deficiency with the 16 foot raise, it actually built in an additional 16 feet of freeboard on this project, um, which greatly reduces the seismic risk of getting a transverse crack in the embankment that can go to a depth that a reservoir can act on it and cause a concentrated leak erosion through it. So this is a table here really of the deformation summaries of station 65. Again, this is not the, the tallest section or the maximum section of the dam, but it does have some fairly low density uh, alluvial layers that we're removing with the buttress. So you can see under the OBE loading with the modifications where essentially we have zero, there's no, no movement really in the model at all, um, which is great because we, you want that OBE to roll through and really not see anything <laughs> manifest, um, especially with a modified project. As we get to the MCE 50th percentile, and then that's about a 2,500-ish year event, um, we do see some crest settlement. Uh, you know, it's a, on the order of about about six feet or so, and then it increases from there for uh, much more extreme events. Again, um, this was designed essentially that you know we would not end up with a an actionable failure mode, but there still will be some some um, amount of deformation here, just given its proximity to the fault and seismic shaking hazard. For station 58, so I guess next slide. So we also analyzed station 58. So 58 is near the maximum section of the dam, which is right near the fault zone itself, where we have a very steep abutment bedrock profile. Um, in this case, we don't have as low density layers, but we do have a lot more driving force with the embankment. And we also have a layer um, that's got a blow count of about 23 at a little bit of depth that was modeled. So for station 58, again, this is for a three to one slope, 40 foot wide crest and 0.75 G. Um, you can see both the horizontal displacements, vertical displacements and uh, maximum shear strain that develops for that as well. This is a summary of those flak results. Again, 
at the OBE level, really um, no movement at all that was being able to be modeled um, from that shake. And then we get smaller amounts of deformation at this section um, than we saw at station 65, so on the order of a foot at the 50th percentile MCE, which is about 0.43 G, and then up from there in terms of deformation. Um, one of the things we wanted to do in design was just verify, like I mentioned, we had some design iterations of the embankment for both, you know, the downstream slope going from basically a three to one to a five to one. We looked at analyses all the way through those those envelopes. Um, we, as, as I mentioned again, I mentioned again, we um, selected a three to one slope with a Rockville section downstream and a 40 foot wide crest. Nest, you know, which was um, adequate to address the failure modes associated with station 65. We felt the same for station 58 with the 16 foot raise. Since 65 was assumed to be the critical section, our 40 foot crest width and three to one downstream slope was adequate in addressing all the failure modes at station 58 as well, um, which are primarily more driven by fault rupture, which I'm gonna talk about here in the next segment of the talk. This next segment of the talk will be um, the design for the fault rupture displacement of the auxiliary dam. So I'm not sure how much you guys have seen these in, in this course, but I'm going to just highlight here this uh, transverse cracking due to fault rupture. So I mentioned that, you know, we, we had a, essentially a fault that was deemed inactive at original construction. And then with, you know, our knowledge today, we know it's active and, and this project's not designed for that. So from an event tree standpoint, it's a fairly easy um, event tree for this failure mode. It's the probability of a continuous flaw, um, which is, I can't see my pointer, but it's on the left, which would be the first node. And that's really, you know, is the earthquake gonna happen? What's the frequency of the earthquake? And then if the magnitude is great enough to essentially rupture through the auxiliary dam. Then if, of course, that's the flaw, we have a flaw, then there's the potential for initiation of erosion, which is really a function then of primarily, you know, where the reservoir elevation is in the driving load. Um, some There are some aspects in terms of the actual type of material. And in this case, you know, both the foundation and, um, well, primarily the embankment that overlies the foundation here is, is highly erodible. It's a highly erodible um, material that erosion would initiate if, if the reservoir pool is at that level um, to drive it. Then we looked at continuation of erosion, progression of erosion, and then breach. So I show this because it's important in terms of how we have addressed the risk. So for fault, fault rupture hazard of the dam itself, um, it's one of those failure mechanisms where you really can't stop it. I mean, you're along for the ride. If the earthquake decides to happen, it's gonna happen. And really the embankment just needs to survive that event and successfully survive the event and and provide you know safety after the event to the public downstream. So we knew we couldn't address the flaw. There, the flaw is likely gonna be there no matter what we do, but we could address the other other nodes on this. So you'll see for the design, we focused a lot on adding filters to this project. And I've talked a lot about filters, and that's what essentially we've tried to do is to filter, you know, any of the um, potential of a of erosion and continuation and progression um, if it does manifest. So for the fault rupture hazard itself, um, you know, this was something that started from scratch. So this goes back to, again to the characterization discussions and um, presentations you've had earlier in this, this, um, this course, it's really paramount to understand the site, right? So we had to start with the characterization of the fault. We knew that this fault was not adequately characterized before, and we've had a facility sitting over it for a number of decades. So we went in and did a, a full site um, investigation, which included paleo seismic trenches upstream and downstream of the dam, um, and it actually quite a bit upstream of the dam in the canyon.
and then a few sites even downstream, um, further downstream of the dam. Um, there was really no knowledge of any design elements in the original design um, to address the fault uh, as an active rupture source. So we were really starting from scratch. Um, we used a lot of geophysics data as well as trenching data. With the trench data, um, you know, we were able to trench at the toe of the dam. We were able to, you know, in summary, really age date recent movements of the fault um, right underneath the dam, really where the bedrock intersects the dam. Um, two events total really in the last several thousand years, which gives us about 3.6 feet of, of deformation per event. So, you know, that that's enough, obviously enough um, movement. Um, this is a a normal fault. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that means here to the dam and the design of the dam. To really get a full understanding of the fault, we had to piece together all the, the blocks. So we had trenches, as I mentioned, we had lots of geophysics done, we had auger borings, we had um, CPTs where we could to get down into to where rock was. Those previous slides, and you'll, you have them in the handouts, is really a step process for us understanding the characterization of the fault. The bottom line is um, we were able to assess the potential of fault rupture, looking at this image sort towards the left side where we have immediate um, potential bedrock, I guess bedrock to embankment interface um, for the fault. And then you'll see also in this, this profile, there's some very steep dips and that's the gray between the white and the gray contrast. The gray is the bedrock and you can see there are some very significant drops, 50 to 100 foot drops of the bedrock profile um, that that go to, you know, essentially the, the base of the, um, the alluvial fan deposit. So we knew there were some steps in there. Um, and we'll talk about the size of the treatment over the fault here as we wanted to definitely capture that area especially for uncertainty on where the fault may manifest to the surface. So for the active section of the fault, as I mentioned, it's really where the bedrock is in contact with the embankment. Um, we two, see two fault strands that were about 50 feet apart. Um, again, you know, based on the datable surfaces, we've seen it essentially two events on this in the last 10,000 years between a magnitude 6.5 and a 7.1 with about 1.1 meter of offset. Couple things in terms of understanding the fault. Um, so there's different ways to look at the fault movement itself. You can look at distributed movements across the fault as if it were to have more, I'd say plastic deformation. If we get a fault rupture at the base of the dam versus kind of the worst case scenario where you get really like what you saw depicted on that other image where you get a drop in the bedrock profile where you get a knife edge, essentially where you would be cutting the bottom of the dam like a knife um, from displacement. And we looked at both of those. Um, we actually factored in the knife edge in the design for the filters and drains just to be a little bit more conservative because we don't know how it would manifest. I mean, um, it's gonna be somewhere in that range though. I kind of touched on this verbally. So there's four segments of the fault. Um, so for co-seismic rupture estimation, we looked at both the frequency of those segments. Um, and if we go to um, kind of the end result for design here was that we ended up selecting a design value of 6.8 feet for this fault. And if you ever have interest in how we got there, there's some papers on that. And I, I can always have a follow on discussion on loading potential of how we came to that value. Um, that's our best estimate design value. However, we know from um, the four segment scenario of this fault, we could see as much as 10 feet on an average displacement um, of potential fault rupture here for the normal fault. The issue here is essentially the gray abutment on the right there stays fixed and the dam and foundation and the section of the fault there essentially settles or moves normal fault movement, moves everything, um, moves the dam down. So everything settles down relative to the right abutment with the fault rupture scenario. Um, that just explains the faulty mechanism, which contributes one to the, the potential for, you know, developing a crack under the dam, but also does lower the dam height 
um, by the amount of the fault rupture because we globally settled the dam on that and that was factored in the design and another reason why it's good to have additional freeboard that we built in. Um, I've touched on this, we've, you know, we've designed for um, 6.8 feet of fault rupture, um, but we also have factored in wide enough filters and drains to accommodate up to 9.8 feet. Um, for the unsegmented, that would be all four segments of the fault rupturing. Now for design and construction here, so for that, we decided to select a filter thickness of twice the fault offset. So we selected a 14 foot wide, sorry, 14 foot thick um, filter to uh, arrest the normal fault movement, as well as a companion 14 foot thick drain layer right over the top of it. Now, you'll see in the section, it's a very large section. And when you start to bring the incline section up, at those thicknesses, we ended up with 40 plus feet, in some cases maybe even more than 50 feet in terms of the width of the filter and the drain um, for those sections of the dam. And the thicker filter itself was between um, station 52 and 58. So if you go to the next slide, um, so looking at the auxiliary dam right abutment, you'll see some red lines there. Our thicker filter section, which we'll talk about, covers the extents over the, the fault, you know, where, where those deeper bedrock profiles are. I guess looking back at the fault here where we have the thicker section on the left, there's a thicker filter and drain. And then just to the right there at station 58, there's a standard filter and drain. And that's where we go back to a normal section. One of the things we wanted to do um, between study, design, and construction was verify that one, the fault that we characterized downstream of the dam and the trenches was where we thought it would be in the foundation and in excavation and in preparation for filter and drain placement. So um, thankfully we did confirm that, in fact, we were within just a few feet of what was being projected for the fault and where the primary tr traces of the fault would be in the foundation of the auxiliary dam and underneath the buttress. Um, we were fortunate to have a very similar, actually mostly the same team um, come out that was part of the original study through design and construction to verify that in the field. Um, bottom line here is we did not need to make any adjustments in construction for the filter and drain. This is like I've been talking about, um, this is the modified section here of the buttress with the filter and drain over the, the fault zone. So. The yellow again is the filter. So this is a 14 foot thick filter and same with the 14 foot thick drain and then the overlying transition in Rockville. You can see most of the material in this section is I'd say high quality, high class, you know, um, filter and drain transition type materials um, to arrest the potential for fault rupture. Again, you know, we can't stop fault rupture, but we can do all that we can to arrest any erosion that could potentially initiate post-event. I'm going to talk a little bit here about borrow and staging areas. So this project has a very large footprint. Um, we had a number of, of borrow and staging areas made available to the contractor, uh, both upstream and downstream of the auxiliary dam, out on what we call Engineer's Point, which became a disposal area, which is kind of in the middle of the reservoir there. You can see the peninsula. And then the borrow area, as I mentioned before, is primarily out of the emergency spillway was used for making um, high quality filter and drain material and, and rock fill. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about mass balance here. You can see that this project really became a very um, very detailed layout of mass balance and mass you know distribution of the project. So we were excavating over three million yards out of the, the spillway between common and blasted rock. Those materials were all being utilized to create um, a little over two, well, between two to three million yards of embankment materials, as well as um, probably about 100,000, maybe 150,000 yards of um, concrete product between mass concrete and structural concrete. One of the things we included to help with bidders was to include a mass balance or really actually it's a materials distribution. 
diagram, this was included in the contract for where, um, you know, where certain materials should be coming from per contract spec, as well as what those CLINs were in terms of quantities um, is the contractor's means and methods to get through the process to come up with a plant um, to make the products. But we, we laid out the fundamental background of where materials could come from on site since we had an on-site quarry. I've got two more segments of this um, case history. So we're gonna talk a little bit about filter design and the gradations um, of the materials for this project. And then we're gonna spend the last portion of this on construction considerations and construction observations and considerations, I guess, in particular. From a filter design and gradation standpoint, we utilize both USACM 1901 as well as the FEMA um, filter manual to design the filters. Um, we really were, you know, as you can see with the cross sections, the filter is, is a very key element of all the modifications that we're doing on this project to address the failure mode. So it was a very key trail to get the right gradation on the filter um, and comfort in that, as well as making sure it was compatible with the, the drain rock, which is our zone 2B and our transition zone 3 on this project. Um, and I'll, I'll focus here that, you know, again, this is focused primarily on the auxiliary dam. This just this part of the discussion again, um, the main dam though, the zones of the main dam used the same approach and we actually were able to fortunately use the, the same filters and drains on the main dam as the auxiliary dam. So the design of the zone 2A, um, so looking at the base soils, our first step here was looking at base soils and um, in particular for the auxiliary dam, the embankment and foundation materials to come up with the base category um, soil, um, which was a three for this project. If you go to the next slide, we also looked at the drain. So both the main and auxiliary dam have blanket drains that were existing that were very pretty variable in gradation because they came from um, multiple sources. So we also wanted to make sure that you know, that our filter is being designed to adequately filter those those um, as a base soil as well. Um, so we did an analysis here of the drain blankets as well um, from that standpoint. Here you'll see this, the next step was the calculation of the minimum D15 for each of the base soils. And you'll see the, the gradation of the, the 2A filter that we ended up adopting um, on the right, and that's in tabular form. So essentially we were targeting something close to an ASTM C33 sand, but slightly different. Um, we were able to manufacture this on site. So we wanted to, to design and come up with a gradation that was most beneficial for the materials that we have on site. You'll see the, for the number 200 sieve, um, we were looking anywhere from zero to 5%. We'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the amount of fines in the filter and and so on here in this part of the presentation. We go to the next slide. Um, and then this is just graphically what the design of the filter zone 2A look like in comparison to the, the base soils and, and design parameters for the filter. So we, you know, fairly tight um, band, but not, I mean, it, you'll see it was fairly easy to achieve this in construction. Um, later on here on the slides. So in addition, obviously to the 2A, we had to make sure we had filter compatibility between zone 2B and 3. So the 2B be in our drain layer, and then of course making sure that our drain layer wouldn't wash into our, our transition layer, which is our zone 3. Those were also checked for um, filter criteria, or making sure essentially that we we're gonna retain the particles and we made, you know, the right adjustments and design of those gradations to um, achieve that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the gradations there. I, I guess I will touch on the zone three. I mean, the intent of the zone three was to have a product that was minimally processed at this project. because we knew we were spending, you know, um, spending more time and effort to build the right or manufacture the right filter and drain. Um, and the transition we were hoping would be a little easier. I think the contractor ended up crushing that as well, um, but it is a fairly easy target for them to stay within. When I get into observations from construction to date, 
I'm going to go through these slides, and then I think since we have the embankment engineer on the line with us, um, you know, he can follow up with any additional comments and obviously the Q&A at the end. So the filter sand material. So I touched on this quite a few times already. The emergency spillway excavation was the granitic rock source for um, making filters, drains, transition, rock fill, concrete aggregates, riprap, everything except for core on this project. Um, so we had an on-site aggregate processing plant that the contractor mobilized that included a primary jaw as well as um, horizontal, horizontal and vertical impact crushers for the secondary plant with a washing facility in order to, to get within the fines tolerance level for the, um, the filters and the drains as well as the concrete products that were being manufactured on site. Um, you'll see on this, there, as I mentioned before, it's close to ASTM C33 fine aggregate. In terms of our filter sand, you can see it, it essentially is in parallel with it, but slightly shifted left. This is just a view of the auxiliary dam construction in about, I'd say, mid, mid to late 2020. And this is really after getting off the bottom. So there's a couple things to point out here. If you look in the distance of the photo um, towards the left above the auxiliary dam, you'll see a very large section of earth downstream. That's the core stockpile that was coming out of the foundation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about core material and um, what we saw in the construction um, in a few slides. But you see here, we've got the horizontal blanket going in, essentially going up the abutment. And then you can kind of see over on the fault zone, the, it's a little bit difficult, but you can see how it steps out and is wider in that area for filters and drains. But it just shows you the, the scale of the operation here to modify this dam. Um, in the foreground, you'll see a, a loader. That's right where the primary crusher is, which went then downhill into a secondary plant, which is off the screen to the right. Um, this is what it looked like on the fill. So this is a, a view looking towards the right abutment um, outside of the fault zone. So this is in the area that we had the 12 foot wide filter um, and, the, and the five foot wide um, drain layer. So you'll see the filter, the drain placement. Um, you'll see the, in this, the preparation of the slope, of the, of the original slope of the dam, excavation into that cleaning and preparation prior to fill placement. You can also see rock fill sort of out in the distance um, in this case, for the auxiliary dam, and I really didn't touch on that much here yet, um, we had two different rock fills that were placed. The auxiliary dam, the contractor had the choice of place moderately weathered and better rock um, for the main dam because of the, the I'd say, the, the smaller section of the overlay. They had to place slightly to unweathered rock fill, which was classified as a 4A material um, for that. Um, we we'll talk a little bit about gradations that we saw in construction. So we'll start with zone one. Um, this gradation really stayed completely in specs. They, they really did not, the contractor didn't have any issues with essentially borrowing from the original auxiliary dam. Some of the dam that was excavated out for the buttress as well as prim primarily the foundation of the auxiliary dam um, became the core borrow source. Um, it it was actually a it fell right in with in the bandwidth for um, basically being minus three inch. There are some oversized, but it was supposed to be three inch minus um, with no more than um, you know with more than twenty percent passing. I should say the the number two hundred sieve, and and we we fell easily within that. Um, as I mentioned, there were some oversized particles that had to be kicked off, but overall was um, this product went in from a gradation standpoint pretty well um, it was pretty easy to meet the spec on that compaction is a little bit different i mean for the most part contractor was able to achieve compaction pretty easily we had a minimum 95 percent relative compaction at um, plus two to minus one percent optimum moisture content for this material it the contractor always said it was too wet they always wanted to decrease the water because um, they complained of it pumping. But as you can see with the plots, we really had, I think, successful placement 
um, both from a, a density relative compaction standpoint as well as getting the right moisture content locked in for zone one on, on the construction of this. So for the filter, um, kind of the same aspects here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the gradation and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the density. So the gradation also has been fairly easy for the most part for the contractor to stay within spec. Um, we did have some concerns early on about you know whether we'd be generating fines um, on this and we'll talk about this, but we, we did a test fill in order to, to kind of prove that out to make sure that we didn't get breakdown of this material. Um, we've had a handful of cases that were out of spec in terms of gradation. Many of those, actually most of those were removed and replaced. Um, there's been some times where the gradations varied, whether, whether it's been finer and then we've seen it um, also coarser in some areas as well. But for the most part, we've been right, right along the averages. Gradation on the drain rock also um, was generally meeting the specifications. There's a few, you know, occasions where we would be out of spec, primarily on the number four sieve, um, but those were either removed or we we assessed those, you know, as not having an issue with filter criteria between the zone two A and the zone three. Um, one thing we did see in the two B, however, though, which kind of surprised our team on site, was that we did see a lot of rock powder um, in two B, and we realized in construction that was likely from the haul traffic over it and we saw that early on um, with just trucks repeatedly passing over the 2b because it is easier to traffic over um, it did cause rock powder so there were preventative measures put in a lot of that was later protected with with plates in order to minimize rock breakdown um, so for zone three i mentioned we were trying to make this a, to be a simple product to manufacture on site or to have um, the material was essentially eight inch minus with no more than 20 percent fines um, there were really only three control points in here for for the gradation bandwidth and this was another one that was fairly easy for the contractor to achieve gradation on and then slide um 78 if you go to the next slide um zone 4b so zone 4b was um a little bit more difficult so as I mentioned, zone 4V is our rock fill gradation. It's predominantly, well, per spec, it's, it's moderately weathered rock and better. Um, you know, minus 24 inch was the upper end. And then we gave the contractor, the contract had a spec limit between zero to 30% passing the number four sieve, which became a little problematic at points because you know, even if the rock was cleaner and we were lower, let's say in the, the order of 10%, 15% minus um, number four, they would, you know, try to add material back in to meet the gradation. So the idea was to have it wide enough that, you know, there would be a pretty wide range of acceptability. But I think that led to some confusion by having such a wide range on the lower end. So for compaction, so this is the section I'm gonna talk quite a bit about here about compaction. Compaction is really important, especially for the zone 2A. So we, we ended up having a method specification for this zone, um, which included 12 inch loose lifts and making sure that we added, added water immediately before compaction to achieve proper compaction. Um, I'm not going to go through all the nuances of the vibratory roller, but they're on the slide. The bottom line here is that we knew um, we were placing a very large, thick, um, clean, granular material in the base of the stamp over the fault zone in particular that was 14 feet in thickness. And we were concerned, as well as reviewers along the way, um, um, both inside and outside the agency that we wanted to make sure we had, had achieved enough compaction that we weren't putting in a bad actor in terms of material. So we proved that out to figure out what the correct densities needed to be for the horizontal drain blanket. And you'll see here that we, we adopted six passes for the drain blanket to make sure that we achieve the right density. And we'll talk about what that density was as well as four passes um, as, as sorry, as as opposed to the four passes that were specified in the chimney drain blanket, where we wanted that section of the dam to be much more self-healing, we didn't want it over compacted. 
um, and so on. So we perform field and, and density and laboratory um, minimum and maximum density tests to verify those target densities. So the target density selection, so again, we have very high PGA here, three quarters of a G. Um, we knew we needed an N160 of at least 30, really, based on these PGAs to not have a problem. So we, we used some literature and, and assistance in terms of what density that should be. Um, that comes out to be a relative density of about 80%. So that was our target of relative density was 80% for the selected horizontal drain blanket. Now this relative density was not a contractual obligation. This was our design. So for the relative density, um, there was some caution about using relative density. Um, so the relative density test itself is very time consuming. You need the minimum, mac minimum density, the maximum density, and the density from the field, which takes a lot of time. Um, we instead um, adopted using relative compaction um, for that with a vibratory hammer early on here for maximum lab density. Essentially, based on some empirical relationships, we ended up for a relative density of 80% that correlated to a relative compaction of 96%, which is a lot easier for us to monitor, check in the field. Um, that was our selected value. Again, that's not a contractual value. That was just making sure our design parameters were met. So test fills, I've touched on this a couple times. Um, the contract included test fills and actually a a line item for test fills in particular. Um, we knew these would be important, one, to assess the equipment that the contractor was proposing to verify some of the design assumptions with materials that were made on site um, from the processing plant to evaluate particle breakdown. And really in a lot of ways was to get, it's a warm up, right? It's like almost like warming up for the actual work, getting all the procedures and and protocols in place between the government and, or the, the owner, in this case, the government and, and the contractor in line before you actually go to production. So some lessons learned on this one, we had, um, we essentially constructed this in a bowl. And I mentioned we added a lot of water to the filter to get compaction, which really didn't work well because it ended up being very soupy. Um, so we ended up with a second test fill um, that was on top of the first one. It was not in the bowl, um, which proved to be very beneficial in terms of proving out both the viability of the spec that we have and and being able to achieve that spec. This is just some photos of the test fill. There were some areas where we did eight passes, some areas with four passes, and some areas with six passes um, to look at the various changes in density as well as particle breakdown of the filter materials. What we did see is that particle breakdown was was very minimal for both the, the 10 and 16 ton rollers the contractor brought. We had a, a roughly a two to five percent increase on view in construction, provided that we were coarse enough coming out of the plant. Um, so essentially, if the material came out of the plant on the coarse side, it would fall right in specs. If they started it on the finer side, you know, it would have been more problematic. So that. That got dialed in early on um, to, to be adequate. The other test fill requirements here, um, you know, we ran the vibratory hammer test and then looked at both saturated samples and we'll talk about dry samples as well. Um, but, you know, ultimately we saw that the dry samples had considerably higher maximum densities than the saturated samples using the vibratory hammer test. Um, and then we also saw that the 10 ton roller had a difficulty in meeting the target density when using the dry laboratory samples, even with eight passes. So after some research, we did suspect excessive particle breakdown was the cause um, from very high laboratory densities. So we saw nearly 10% on some sieves that had an increase um, and really it was a technical rationale and evidence to discount dry laboratory compaction samples. We just, there was an issue with that. Um, so the other, one of the other, or two other things that really came out of this. Um, so one, you know, you wanna use virgin samples for the lab tests. You don't wanna grab samples that have already been through essentially the 
you know, the hauling, placing, and banking process first, and then also to use laboratory density results of the saturated samples. So the end game in all this, of course, for us was to achieve, you know, to ensure that we achieve the required density of the liquefiable, potentially liquefiable materials. And in this case, we didn't want the filter being liquefiable. Um, so we started questioning using relative compaction and why not just run the relative density test directly to verify that. And we knew that that would take a significant amount of time in order for us to, um, to kind of prove out that correlation, like I mentioned, between the minimum and the maximum densities and the time associated with that in construction isn't worthwhile. Um, so we did end up um, making some adjustments um, ultimately to assess and, and approve those, prop, those materials. So I'm gonna just highlight a couple things here um, as we close the presentation. I've got just a few more slides. So construction highlights um, at the auxiliary dam. So the dam itself was constructed between March of 2020 and was topped off in October of 21, just ahead of flood season. You know, overall, like I mentioned, the placement of the filter sand went very well. We achieved all the densities we were looking for. Um, really didn't have any major reworks. There were some minor ones here and there, but um, you know, we were, the histogram showed that 90% of the density tests were above 80% um, relative density and the lowest one really being 69%, which all in all isn't all that bad of a relative density either. So um, yeah, we were very comfortable with the placement of the, the filter. If you go to just some photos here. So um, in the upper left, you'll see the compaction and you'll see water being um, water being added in front of the roller. And then, you know, it's just, there, there were a lot of issues early on in getting the right amount of water. So you'll see um, that hose was not enough <laughs> in order to achieve compaction. They later started using water trucks to get enough water out. Um, you'll see to the right, um, upper right, and then the lower left, ultimately to get the right moisture conditioning prior to compaction. Talk about a couple successes here. So some successes on the 2A, so the filter zone, the gradation was a success. Um, it's been good and consistent. There's been very few failed gradations on density. We got the densities, like I mentioned, that we wanted um, with our method spec after proving it out through the test fill and making the right adjustments during construction for both making sure we had the right water um, being furnished ahead of compaction as well as making sure that we had the right testing and understood our tests. And then for zone one, um, like I mentioned, we, we've been well within the specifications on that. We've had some oversized particles which have required some hand labor to remove, but it's been fairly straightforward placement operation and the compaction of moisture has been um, excellent to date. So. And we're done actually with placing zone one and zone 2A and zone B, 2B actually for that matter. Feeling was the method specifications preferred um, on this, but you do, I think it simplifies construction, but you need to make sure that there, you have the right targets originally. And it's, I think it's really good to verify those with a test fill, mostly just to get everybody row in the right direction um, and making sure that if we need to make a, an adjustment, um, we could do that. So in our case on this contract, we had, if we did not have enough roller passes, for instance, we did have options in the contract for additional roller passes in order to meet um, desired densities. Um, perform density testing for record sampling. So relative compaction with vibratory hammer is a good option in low seismic areas or liquefaction or where liquefaction of the filter is little concern. In high seismic areas where liquefaction is a concern of a filter, you know, the use of relative density is, is really important with the vibratory table and that's recommended. And again, it, it does, I don't know if I covered that great, but it, it does add time that needs to be factored in, but it is the right test. It's the tried and true test for um, assessing liquefiability when you get the relative density directly. Test fills are definitely recommended 
um, exercise caution when using vibratory hammer tests on crushed angular sand um, due to the potential breakdown. Just need to be be careful and understand what the test is giving you. Um, I touched on this already, but I think it's paramount to use you know, virgin samples from the stockpile um, for laboratory density tests. Don't use samples that have already been, again, you know, hauled, placed, compacted on. Um, they may not be indicative of what you're seeing once that material is compacted because you're really double handling it with that test. Uh, run gradation tests on samples after laboratory density tests. Make sure that, you know, essentially you're not getting, you know, some kind of breakdown that could be affecting the test. And then run gradation tests on the, the density samples and compare them to the original lab samples. Like I mentioned, it's just understanding, you know, what may be happening to your sample during the test and how that compares to the actual placement in the field. So we did, you know, particle breakdown occurred during all phases of filter sand placement. Uh, in our case, we had very fil very little breakdown, but we did see breakdown. Um, but, you know, breakdown at each step does add up. So you just want to make sure um, the total of that breakdown is within your specification limits. Um, we did see, as I mentioned, significant particle breakdown um, due to haul trucks on and trafficking on the fill. And that was predominantly on the 2B material where we saw rock powder, which was a mystery at first until we understood where that was coming from. Just in general, production, you know, and execution of the, con of the contract does not take ownership of quality. So it's really, you know, we rely heavily in, in USACE for government quality control um, by the contractor, but also you know, very heavy QA presence as well, making sure that our quality assurance um, catches things and hopefully it's caught by QC first, but sometimes it's not. Um, you know, it, it's frustrating because sometimes you get repetitive mistakes. And in this case, we had lots of, con not, I'd say concerns, but issues with chimney widths. We had varying chimney widths and, you know, in, in some cases, or most cases, they were fatter than they should have been. Um, but just things that are simple in, in terms of lines and grades and control in the field that were repetitive, unfortunately. And then lack of water on 2A. There was always a lack of wanting to place sufficient water on 2A. I've touched on the, the 2B already here and the breakdown of 2B. So I won't hit on that again, but that was a definitely a, an observation on this one. And then on the 4B, I've also touched on this, but because of the way our specification limits were open, especially on the minus number four, um, there was a, a tendency of the contractor to try to place additional material in um, to try to fill in that part of the gradation band, which really was not required um, to meet density or the functionality of the, the 2B. If you go to the next slide, this is my last slide. Um, so learning objectives and recap. So I, first of all, thank you for bearing with me for two hours here and through all the technology challenges, hopefully I've come across um, pretty clearly and I'm, I'm glad because it looks like we got some time for, for questions. I haven't had any of those so far. Um, but with that, I was hoping with this case history that you've been able to understand one for Isabella, the, the uh, major risk driving failure modes that we've had to address from hydrologic overtopping to seismic to internal erosion. Understand, you know, how we've addressed those and some of the design iterations, especially with the embankment and the auxiliary, auxiliary dam embankment that came into play from a seismic consideration standpoint um, and constructability standpoint. And also, that you've been able to get a handle on, you know, sourcing of materials for this project, handling of those materials, and sequencing those materials with mass balance and mass distribution. And then, of course, here, just what I highlighted, the um, observations from constructions and lessons learned um, to date. And I guess, uh, Henry, too, if there's anything, Henry, if you want to add in. He did a very good job there, but the one thing I want to add in, just want to the lessons learned or problem we had here, not directly related to materials, but in this day and age of construction, everything is computerized now. 
they have guys out there with these little rover computers tell them lines and grades they plug everything into dozer so the guy in the dozer just looks at the computer screen and we've had countless times where their civil model was an error and we go out there and tell them we were cutting the slope wrong and say no we're doing it right according to the model well it turned out their model was wrong so something to be cautious about in any jobs you're working on is always Never trust the model. Always have independent verification for lines and grades, which here we use station offset to our CAD sections. But that was actually one of the bigger problems we had out here was accurate lines and grades. Great ad. So um, any anybody have any questions for Henry or David? So it, it's I've just got one, Henry. So it sounds like we had... I, I can't recall for, did we have uh, government surveyors checking lines and grades at times, Henry? Uh, we did have government surveyors out here, yes. we. That also provided verification. And the contractor had surveyors too. The thing is, it seems like the way industry is going is they want less surveyors and they want more to have operators that they call grade checkers carrying this little survey stick with a computer screen on it. And so I think that's the that's the big thing is you need more you need to go back and have more actual surveyors doing independent checks out there. Thanks again, Henry and David. Yep. Have a great afternoon.